Well, blessings to you. It's Pastor Mike Miano again here, uh, thinking through scripture. We're going to get right into it. I just wanted to share a couple details with you. Uh, first off, I wanted to say thank you. Thank you to those of you that shared the video yesterday as we began this uh, journey through scripture. Um, thank you for all the great insights, all the great questions, all the great encouragements that I received in those regards. Thank you again. Um, I can't say it enough. Um, it was encouraging. It really motivated me to uh, dive into scripture and to study even more myself. Look forward to uh, come on here get, to get on here and actually go through some of these details with you. Another thing I wanted to mention was about Bible translations. Uh, as we jump right into the beginning of scripture here, I think this is the perfect time to just kind of give a brief little uh, explanation or detailing of Bible translations. Now, going from yesterday's video, I'm sure we're all aware that where we are right now in scripture was originally written on cuneiform tablets, uh, hardly in English, you know? Uh, it was actually in pictorial hieroglyphics that would have been the style of writing from that time um, in the ancient Near East. So now that we know that, we know that these writings, and you know, you move forward, most of the right, the Old Testament is Hebrew, the New Testament is Greek. And since maybe the 1600s, you know, it's actually relatively uh, recent that the church has had this ability to translate the Bible, you know, back in time, you'd be killed. You know, it was a big deal to translate the scriptures to uh, Latin. That was the Latin Vulgate. That was one of the first translations outside of the Hebrew and the Greek. Um, besides, you know, there's a lot of other writings um, in the Syriac, um, the Peshitta, uh, a bunch of different writings that um, are in different languages that came out of the Old Testament times as well. However, talking about the whole canon, the Bible, uh, the church, the Catholic Church, was very protective over the text. And it, for a while, only the Latin text led the way. And only those that could read and write in Latin would be able to, you know, have the Bible and use the Bible, teach the Bible. And then later on, uh, other translators came in. And at first, this was something that was persecuted in the church that, you know, that wasn't encouraged, especially in England. Um, one of my favorites, John Wycliffe, who would actually write the teachings down of the Bible in English and would pass it on to these followers of his who later became known as Lollards. And these Lollards would go and mumble in English. They would mumble scriptures. Again, this is a, some beautiful stuff. You know, most people, you know, haven't uh, spent time to really appreciate how the Bible has uh, gotten to us. And I know I, I belong to a crowd of Christians that just, uh, I thank God that we have this desire to study this desire to look into the historical context of scripture. And I know many of you have expressed being encouraged by that. So uh, ultimately the reason why we're doing this video series. So, um, you know, I wanted to bring us into that. Now, here we are in 2017, and there's probably about 200 and something Bible translations in English alone. Uh, you know, everything from the New Living Testament to the NIV, to the King James Version, to the um, New American Standard to King James Clarified, as is the Bible I'm using, and the World English Translation, which is what I'm using for the Old Testament. I have this new Bible I bought, the Kingdom Bible. Uh, you could actually Google Fulfilled Bible Prophecy, and you'll find, you know, look up the Kingdom Bible. And uh, I and myself are, and others, uh, um, I myself, I and others are commentators in this uh, Bible. It was really encouraging to be able to write commentary for the book of Kings. And I was able to, uh, encourage, uh, people with, uh, you know, some of my thoughts in Kings in this translation, it's like, or in this Bible, it's called the kingdom Bible and the translation I I'm using in this Bible or that the, uh, those that published this Bible put together was the world English translation for the old Testament and the King James clarified for the new Testament. Now, most Bibles, if you go into the beginning pages, they're going to have a, a area where they're going to explain all of that. So if you're really big on that, or you, you find yourself in discussion with somebody that's really big on that, you know, just flip open to that that cover page there, and you know, do some reading, do some discussing about you know how these Bibles, why certain translations have come about. A lot of times, it's over different words, and uh, you know, again, I, I don't believe anybody's professing to know it all or have it all perfect. So. Um, you know, that's, that's what we, uh, you know, we're coming together as a community and we're, you know, ever reforming, semper reformando, what the church is called to be, what Christians ultimately should be. 
and uh, we're you know we're going over scripture we're rightly dividing it we're changing certain teachings if we misunderstood certain things before you meet somebody else they have better insight they've studied something a little bit more you find iron sharpening iron and then you know you change certain things so that's where a lot of the translations have come about and uh, it's an encouraging study it's a long-winded study you know to get into some of those specifics and see why different translations are there now one of my favorite ways of explaining it would be the chart right you picture two ends and at this end would be a word for word and that this end is thought for thought now word for word means that when they were translating it they went you know what does the word living thing mean or what does this hebrew word mean and how do i translate it perfectly in the english whereas thought for thought is more trying to help you understand the con the thought that is being conveyed rather than being specific in detailing what that word actually meant. So King James Version would be on one side, uh, probably one of the strongest translations in word for word. And then uh, what's that? Young's literal translation is another one that's almost you know word for word, but the English is very choppy and hard to read. And then, and obviously you could get a Hebrew Greek uh, interlinear and you can find those details there as well. So then on the thought for thought, you would say something like the Message Bible um, or the New Living Testament or the New Living Translation. NIV is, you know, pretty much thought for thought as well. Um, however, most people, most Christians these days would feel comfortable using an NIV, even in a discussion on word for word, you know, details or more in-depth contextual details through scripture. So all of that said, I want to bring us right into our teaching today for, you know, our reading if you're following along at BibleTools.com, the Chronological Bible Reading Plan, our reading for today would be Genesis chapters 4 through 7. Three chapters. Again, this is great that we're going to be able to get through the Bible in a year if you started with us yesterday. Again, you have perfect time to catch up. Seven chapters. Just read them and catch up with us. And I'm going to give you some details to encourage your study to help you clarify some of the things that you're reading in the text. So yesterday, what we established, before we do that, let's pray. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you all the glory, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for going before us in this study, that you would lead many to clarity, Lord, in regards to your word, and prayerfully a heart to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, we thank you for your spirit that clarifies your teachings, Lord. That mere human wisdom, mere human reading, Lord, would not be sufficient in our understanding of you, but it is a wisdom from above that you have given us, Lord, that we desire and we seek more of, Lord, in you. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for that spirit. Thank you for that desire. Lord, go before us in our study today. Give us clarity. Give us, uh, ready our minds for the details to be presented to us, for us to understand those details and then be empowered by them, Lord. We thank you for your truths. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray to you, we glorify you, and we magnify your name. Amen. So, again, thank you for uh, joining me on this video. So, we're at Genesis chapter 4. Through seven. Now, just to back up yesterday, what we established was what we're going to call the covenant man, Adam. We established that story that's beginning with the temple text of the declaring of a one true God as reigning sovereign among his people. And his people are Adam, right? And Adam and Eve. And they become his covenant people living in the Garden of Eden, being given a law not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. However, to eat of all the trees of the garden, essentially a beautiful pictorial image of God's presence. And we established that that was what was being uh, detailed there. I had shared that that would be a view called Covenant Creation. And I invited you to visit my blog site, mianogonewild.wordpress.com. And that's M-I-A-N-O, gone wild at uh, M-I-A-N-O, gone wild, dot wordpress.com. And if you go there, um, you'll find an introduction to Covenant Creation. And that is the understanding that I painted and I presented to us from Scripture yesterday in our video. So thank you for joining me here on Thinking Through Scripture. And we're just going to do a quick outlining here of Genesis 4 through 7. So at the end of yesterday's chapter, we read through the death. The death that unfortunately happened by way of Adam and Eve not listening to God and unfortunately wandering over to that tree of the knowledge of good and evil listening to the serpent, and again, we went over that yesterday, that we don't believe the serpent to be a talking snake, but instead understanding the context, understanding the culture, that this serpent was most likely an idol worshiper that was about to lead them astray. And I had mentioned that in scripture, you see 
the serpent being used, that pic picture of a serpent, again, something that was very much highlighted in the ancient Near East, as a cunning, crafty uh, deceiver, um, one would, that would lead you against the truth of God. So the serpent, this idol worshiper, comes over and tells them they're able to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which most likely was a tree had, that had been dedicated over to idols. God told them to stay away from it. That's sufficient. Unfortunately, they, 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 unfortunately, they don't. They go over there, they eat of the tree, and they die. Now remember, God told them, the day you eat of the tree, you shall surely die. Now, that's what we have to ask ourselves. What death did Adam and Eve die that day? Now, if you continue reading into chapter 4, it says, says so, it says, so Adam knew Eve, his wife. Let me take a sip of soda so I don't keep slipping over my words. Okay, so Adam knew his wife. So we know they did not die biologically that day. There's many that would argue that they eventually would die biologically. However, I'm going to present to you that that's not the case at all. What Adam dies is the death that at Jesus defeats. So this is very important. And that day, again, you could do the study. There's many uh, scholars out there that have done the study in regards to the word yom in Hebrew and how it means a 24-hour day, the death they died that day. And the death they died that day was twofold. They unfortunately would never have that experience of the Garden of Eden because they're, they're removed from the Garden of Eden. Their relationship with God, that having no shame in the presence of God, was now gone, and they'd never have that back. Now they had, the, they had the need for a covering. They didn't have the need for a covering before. There was no necessary need for it. But now, unfortunately, they have the need for a covering. They've died. So we're going to talk about that covering here in a moment. However, now that they've died, there's another death experience. And that death experience is that when they biologically die, they're not going to be able to wear the covering. You see, the covering is, in this picture here, it's animal sacrifice. They're given the animal skins. And you're going to see later on, as the story carries out, why animal skins are very important in this creation account. Um, essentially, that's their relationship with God is based upon sacrifice of animals. And this is going to be called the Law of Moses. This is their clothing that they're given. Now that they, they've severed their relationship with God um, in the Garden of Eden. Now they've been removed from the Garden of Eden and they've been covered and their covering is their new experience with God, their new relationship outside the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden was eternal life, was life to the full. Um, now, unfortunately, they're going to have to live under this covering. So what we read next as we move into chapter four is we begin to see the family story, the effects of um, a people that are set on rebellion. Again, you look at our 21st century culture, you look around and you say, wow, it seems like we're suffering the effects of a people stuck on rebellion, having an attitude of rebellion. Uh, Adam and Eve have children. They have Ad Cain and Abel. And if you went to Bible school when you were a kid, um, I didn't. And I knew this story growing up as well. Um, Cain kills Abel and Cain is kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Obviously, there's a couple things that are important to note there that Cain is fearing those outside the Garden of Eden. That proves that Cain wasn't under the assumption that unfortunately many Christians in the 21st century are that Adam and Eve were the first two people. Because where are these people that he's fearing? Why does he even have a concept of other people being outside the Garden of Eden? And he also goes and meets a wife later on uh, that, that'll create some issues for where did these people come from. And the gymnastics that I've seen people do, you know, I've asked the Jehovah Witnesses, I've asked the Mormons, I've asked the average everyday Christian that goes to church every Sunday. I've asked pastors and I've heard all sorts of strange theories and notions of everything from uh, that God didn't stop creating after Adam and Eve or um, that was his sister and she followed him. Uh, you know, again, it, things, it, it gets ludicrous. So unfortunately, the effect that we do see here, though, is that Cain kills Abel. Cain has, suffers jealousy, that sin is crouching at the door, ready to seize him and seem, uh, and Cain, unfortunately, falls victim. And uh, he gets removed from the Garden of Eden to the land of Nod. Again, a phrase that is uh, wandering. It's not even a place. The land of Nod is not a place. Land of Nod is the land of wandering. He just removed from, the, um, from this. Now they're not in the garden, but now he's removed from this area of covering. Now he's even removed even further to be like those that are far off. Those that are wandering the face of the earth with no hope and no God in the world. Again, you see this in the New Testament in Ephesians. This is the Gentiles. That's what Cain has essentially done. He's removed from that covering area, that area of covering, and he's just sent out to wander the face of the earth. 
And uh, then we see that they begin to have a new uh, covenant lineage that starts in chapter 5, and that's Seth. Seth is the hope, right? Uh, again, this would have, Eve would have seen this as the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15, where they were told that their, uh, their seed would crush the head of the serpent. Again, the problem is that these people were very focused on lineage. So now Cain kills Abel. They're looking at their lineage and they're saying, oh, this is the effects of the death that we, you know, we've uh, experienced. And um, they're right. So Seth is set up and Seth would have been seen almost as a Messiah because he's going to, you know, be the, uh, in that day God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. And you see this covenant is reinitiated with Seth. And then you read through chapter five and it's, the outworking of that lineage up until the time of Noah. Seth pretty much brings forth Noah's lineage. And these are the generations of Adam. There's so much I could say about Genesis chapter 5, verses 1 through 2, um, tall dots and you know ancient writings, and how this pretty much proves, the style of this writing proves that this is a text coming from the ancient Near Eastern times. Um, again, I would encourage you to look into tall dots. That's T-O-L-E-D-O-T-H. And uh, they're referencing in the ancient Near Eastern world and how that would work in reference to Genesis chapter 5. Some amazing stuff if you do the digging and you do the study. So now we're reading the lineage here in chapter 5 of Adam's lineage, um, ultimately through Seth. And that's pretty much what you read in chapter 5. Nothing fancy. Chapter 6, you move into that and we begin to read about the sons of the gods and the daughters of Adam. Now in your Bible, it probably says, let's see what this translation says here it says it happened when men began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them see I, I like this this is good because Bene Elohim that phrase is the sons of God right that's what's translated in most translations it says the sons of God however that phrase can also be the sons of the gods because Elohim is a plural term so it doesn't mean one God it can mean gods or one God it, it, depending upon the context when used in reference to the Hebrew God, we know it's talking about one God. When it's being used in reference to the pagans, it's being, you know, the idol worshippers, it's multiple gods, plural gods. So as we follow this story, we've been following the lineage of Adam. I believe that's evident. And when it says here, it happened when men began to multiply in the face of the land and daughters were born to them. Oh, this does say that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful. Unfortunately, that's not what's happening here. What's happening here is the daughters of Adam, again, Adam is a phrase, a word that can also mean man. So where it says men began to multiply, it's, you know, when Adam began to multiply in the face of the land, when his lineage began to increase after, um, you know, as these time went on, you just read in chapter five, that lineage, and daughters were born to them, that the Bene Elohim, the sons of the gods, these pagan people, uh, saw that the daughters of Adam were beautiful and they took for themselves wives. Now remember, again, what's the whole point here? To be separate. Do not go near those trees over there. Do not go near that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because I explained yesterday the context of how that would have been seen in an ancient Near Eastern culture. Stay away from them. And then you see here, unfortunately, that um, the things just get wicked. You know, the Nephilim, this giant breed. Again, you see this. Uh, these people again later on in Joshua. Um, don't start conjuring up images of aliens and everything else. Um, allow this to be what it is. When you read further in the Bible, these are bigger people that were seen in the land. Remember Israel when they were about to enter into the land of Canaan, they say, we see these people, but we appear as grasshoppers in their sight. Um, you know, they were big, they were far more numerous than Israel. Um, that's the picture you should be getting. So, uh, unfortunately, this is where they stem from. This is that, that beginning of that wicked uh, lineage of uh, Nephilim and the sons of Anak. And uh, you'll see them later on as well. And uh, wickedness just increases because they done what God told them not to do. They have not stayed separate. And uh, what this ultimately leads us to is the story of Noah. And again, in our culture, you know, they had the movie Noah. We have um, you know, Noah's Ark, as I see, I see it all over the place. I think we have a preschool here, um, Noah's Ark. So we all, we've all heard the story, you know, and everybody has this picture of a uh, global flood and uh, how chaotic that gets. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna close if you do the reading, chapters 6 through 7, that's pretty much what you're reading is Noah's Ark. So I'm going to close with some details about Noah's Ark. What I want to say just to follow up to everything I just said is that 
from Genesis chapter 1 all the way up to Genesis chapter 6, you're reading the ancestral story of the image of God, the people of God, those that had been set up to convey the one true God to the nations. And this will lead into the lineage of Israel. I have a writing I had written on that uh, called The Ancestry, Ancestral Story of the Image of God. You can Google that. Just I would encourage you to Google Ancestry Story, The Ancestral Story of the Image of God, Michael Mianga. And that writing will come up right away on Google. Another thing I would encourage you to do as we move into the story of Noah's Ark um, is to pick up a copy or to order a copy of Beyond Creation Science by Tim Martin and Jeff Bowman. A great book, a lot of encouraging stuff, a lot of uh, stuff that speaks beyond just Genesis chapters 1 through 5. Um, you know, and ultimately as we move into Genesis chapters 6 through 7 and 8, um, Noah's Ark, they bring forth such amazing stuff there. And if you've ever found yourself in a discussion or maybe even in your own mind, having a problem with science and having a problem with the Bible, uh, their book is a book to get. It's a, it's a good book to get your hands on. Um, there's so many other books to probably tell you about, but that's going to be the one that I'm going to mention for now. And uh, to come to a close, let's talk about a flood here. Now, unfortunately, most people read this and they do not understand that the word in the Bible that's used for Eretz, world, in the Hebrew, can also be land. So where you're reading about world or earth, most likely it could also mean land. Just like in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That word there means land, it means skies and land. Unfortunately, in the English, we're relying upon translators. We're relying upon English translators that are determining for themselves, that do understand the Hebrew, uh, where this text is talking about the globe or the world, and where this text is speaking about specific land, you know, an actual piece of land, a terra firma. So that's the, uh, that's the issue we, we have in, in reading. So I'm going to posit to you that... Noah's Ark was a flood of the land. It was a judgment upon Adam's lineage for not walking worthy as they're called to, as the image of God. Again, they, they began to intermingle with the sons of the gods, and things began to get increasingly wicked, as you see right there in chapter 6. So it actually says, you know, they were in the land in those days, and after that, when the sons of the gods cohabitated with the daughters of Adam, they gave birth to children. These were the mighty men, the men of ancient times, the men of renown, uh, Yahweh saw that the wickedness of men was great in the land and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart were only evil every day. So that's what's happening. That's the scene here. It's this lineage of Adam that we're following, though. It's not the, you know, the world or the globe or God's not holding these nations outside the, the Gentiles responsible for this at the moment. Later on, he will. However, there's a couple, uh, I have a couple sermons on Noah's Ark. You know, I would urge you to go to a Blue Point Bible Church podcast. Just go to, just Google that, Blue Point Bible Church podcast, and it'll come right up. And um, you can listen to some sermons about Noah's Ark. However, there's a couple things here in the text that I just wanted to point out to you. Moving into chapter four, 7. In seven days I will cause it to rain on the region for 40 days and 40 nights. Every living thing that I have made I will destroy from the surface of the land. You see, again, now that depends on your Bible translation. This Bible translation is faithful to the text, so they seem to be conveying this local um, understanding. Moving into verse 17, the flood was 40 days on the land, the water increased and lifted up the ship, and it was greatly lifted up, it was lifted up above the land. See, many translations will say it was lifted up above the earth, and it was lifted up above the land, and the waters prevailed and increased greatly upon the, the world, some might say. This says the region, and the vessel floated on the surface of the waters. You see, Again, the picture you should have is all the, the, in Israel, there's no mountains, really. It's just big hills. So you picture all the hills are covered with water. Verse 19. The waters prevailed increasingly on the land. All high hills that were under the whole heavens were covered. You see, whole heavens there is an issue for many people. Uh, I would encourage a study on that. I've mentioned that in some sermons I've preached. I encourage a study on the whole, under the whole heavens. And you'll see many times that word was used to talk about judgment upon a certain city. That everybody, every man under the heavens was killed, but it was a destruction of Egypt. You know, it, it wasn't talking in reference to the whole world. So we want to be careful and make sure we're consistent in regards to these terms. And then in verse 21 through 24, it says, All flesh died that moved upon that region. You see, this text is faithful um, to what the 
Hebrew would have conveyed, including birds, livestock, beasts, every creeping thing that creeps on the land, and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life. All of that was in the dry, dry ground died. Every living thing that was that was wiped out on the surface of the ground or the land, including man, livestock, creeping things, and birds of the heavens, they were wiped out from that region. Only Noah was left alive, and those who were with him in the ark. The waters prevailed upon that region 150 days. 40 days and 40 nights of judgment upon a, you know, a, a time of completion. That's what 40 days and 40 nights is often used as in Scripture. If you look into that, again, you could go to Google, put in 40 days, 40 nights Bible, and it'll come up with probably a couple links that you can learn about that 40 days and 40 nights period, um, what that meant to that culture. So I thank you for tuning in. I, think, I, I encourage a, a continual going through these details, further study in what we've called and what we're noting as audience relevance, leading our study rather than irrational thoughts and presuppositions and assumptions. We're going to dive into this thinking through scripture and really understanding what uh, the Bible has to say. So I believe God was glorified today. I pray that you were encouraged and you were edified. And if you were, I know God was glorified. So that's the awesome part about this. So let's just end with a quick praise to him. And uh, I thank all of you again for tuning in. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we just come before you humble, Lord, that your truth is available, that you are available to us, Lord. Go through our minds, Lord. Stay in our minds. Increase your understanding in our minds so that we will follow through with our study that will continue to be zealous in these regards, Lord, that will want to know your truth. God willing, share your truth with someone else to see you further glorified, Lord. Thank you for all that you give us. We magnify your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you again for tuning in. I pray that you were encouraged. My email is christianitygonewild at yahoo.com and my Facebook is Michael Miano, M-I-A-N-O. Find me on Facebook, uh, send me an email, let me know what your thoughts are, your concerns, maybe an area I'm, I'm in need of correction, or maybe an area I'm in need of encouragement, and uh, maybe if you have questions, let me know, and I'd love to respond to you and begin having a great conversation in regards to God's Word. Go in peace.